significance of the Supreme Court ruling. To help us appreciate what else was at the heart of the ruling, we turn to someone who followed the process, an advocate of the court, Olivia Charim Pamatovo. You're most welcome to NTV tonight. Thank you, Rita. Getting straight into the conversation, I want us to take a look at the nature of this particular presidential petition, how it was carried out, and also comparing it to Uganda. Well, I think the petition was carried out well. The, it reflected an independence of the judiciary and the bar. Uh, there was a lot of courtroom decorum and respect from the lawyers and the justices. And most importantly, it reflected the role of the legal fraternity, the lawyers, the justices, in determining the affairs of nations. So I'm glad that we finally have a position and that we know where the future of Kenya in terms of their politics is going. Well, when you talk about the independence, another area to look at was also the unanimous decision on all these nine questions and the pleadings. What were your thoughts? Was it a surprise? I, I wouldn't say surprise. What I saw that the court analyzed the evidence before the court and, and, and set the rules that apply in law. For instance, when you, you file a petition as a petitioner, you have a burden of proof to prove your case. So the court relied on the evidence and stated that the burden of proof was not, was not met by the petitioners. But the other aspect that the court looked at was the issue of substantiality. That what, even when they th thought that, when they found that there were some irregularities in the process, let's say the IT system and some of the processes, they found that it was not substantial enough to annul the election. And we have seen that in Uganda as well, that the Ugandan courts have also used the same principles in determining election disputes and setting the same rules. So I think it shows us a very good example of some of the systems that are carried across the region in terms of legal interpretation. Mm -hmm. When you talk about legal interpretation, you talk about the evidence having been presented. If you were a lawyer of uh, Ryle Odinga at this point in time, your client saying, yes, this is what you've had to say as a court, but I dismiss it, I am not for it, what would you be thinking tonight? I think my thought would be in terms of looking at the analysis of the court and seeing whether the court has analyzed the evidence very well and given what ordinarily the court should give in a decision. So once that is done, obviously as lawyers we do our very best and at the end of the day our court requires us to actually give justice, to promote justice. So once the court has analyzed the evidence and made a decision, we are all bound by that decision. So you'd be convincing your client in this, at this point that do we go with it? Where would you go from there? Well, right now as it is, the Supreme Court has ruled, so we are bound by the decision. So uh, yes, I'd convince my client that is the final say. We must go by it. Okay. Yes. Lastly, what's that one thing that uh, we would pick as Ugandans from this ruling and we could take forward? As Ugandans, I think what I would say would pick is the fact that we, we saw a judiciary that is independent. We saw a judiciary that worked, and, and I think I saw one of the reports that a few lawyers tried to call the justices, but they avoided mm -hmm. picking their calls because they wanted to be independent in their decision. So I think that's a very good thing to hear from the judiciary, and I hope that even our Uganda judiciary can flee away from intimidation, influence, and make a decision that is their own, that they can actually own themselves and have their consciences free even if, no matter what the, the other voices will be, as long as they've analyzed the evidence, they have used the law and have come up with a decision. Okay. Thank you for joining us on NTV tonight, Olivia.